Thank you. Thank you very much, Con. Uh, there, I, I did a handout uh, which uh, was at the desk, but some of you who may have come early may not have gotten it. But uh, if you do get a copy of it, it will prevent you from uh, the necessity for any vigorous note taking because I've tried to uh, basically, uh, you know, report in writing on most of the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, there have been uh, a huge uh, number of developments, as you probably know, in the two in the two year two week period. Uh, and I'm going to, I'll touch on uh, uh, many of them, uh, but I'll try to comment on what I think are sort of the top, the top four or five that I think have legs and will have a significance that's, uh, you know, sort of beyond the transient. But uh, before I begin, I should, I should hasten to report uh, the development that uh, before Professor Curley interrupts, Hurley interrupts my remarks, uh, to declaim uh, my alma mater and those of the rest of you who didn't go to BU. Uh, congratulations are due to the uh, NCAA championship BU Thank hockey you. team Thank and you. so on. I know that that was going to come up today, so I just thought I'd mention it before uh, before he did. Okay, first development in the uh, in the ca category of the Obama administration is uh, the president announced a series of changes relating to U.S. policy towards Cuba. Uh, and the, in general, the thrust is to reach out to the Cuban people. Specifically, uh, there's going to be an alleviation of the bans on family visits and remittances to family members in Cuba. Uh, and this has been reported in the press that now you can send money to Cuba, uh, but that would not be a good idea because uh, the OFAC regulations and executive directives have not actually been changed yet, and you should not do that unless you have an actual relative in Cuba. The regulations will be fairly technical. You have to be within certain degrees of, of relationship, and your relative cannot be a government official of the Cuban government and so on. So something will happen on that, but it's a thing that was sort of in the pipeline. Uh, the next thing was, in a speech at Georgetown University, the president basically described the administration's current strategy, and he contrasted sort of the alternatives to the strategy that's now currently been settled on to say that simply allowing banks in the United States to fail uh, involved huge risks and conversely nationalizing banks, which has been a suggestion that many people have made, was also, in his view, uh, inappropriate. Therefore, a middle ground that uh, the administration has settled on is this, you know, PIPIT, choose your own acronyms, uh, 3PIP, I call it, but PPIP, the private public investment program that was mentioned on, or that was in effect announced in some detail on March 23 is the way forward as far as the administration is concerned. Um, the president stated his view that that was the best middle ground to pair uh, government resources with private investment in order to clear away the toxic assets which are preventing banks from lending money. Right. On April 19th, administrative, uh, administration officials stated that as a result of the administration's stress test, and I think this is a, this is a major issue, there's the 800-pound the gorilla uh, in the room is what's going to happen as a result of this pre uh, the stress test, which has been applied to the largest 19 banks in the United States. And to make a long story short, the administration's caught between a rock and a hard place if the results of the test are that everybody passes, as the New York Times writes, then the test will lose its credibility completely. Conversely, if they announce that the many banks in the top 19 are in trouble, that would be obviously a bad, uh, that would be bad news. But in any event, on the talk shows, administration officials uh, are now saying that they think that uh, the top 19 are adequately capitalized. Uh, and uh, one presidential advisor, David Axelrod, paraphrased uh, Jack Nicholson's famous phrase in A Few Good Men, the American people are ready for the truth. Uh, and it's expected that the first week in, uh, in May uh, we'll be hearing the results of the stress test, which will try to, in effect, draw, you know, there'll be a middle ground between everything's okay and, uh, and we're, in, we're in big trouble. Uh, on the 19th of April, uh, presidential uh, economic advisor Larry Summers, uh, late of Harvard University, um, indicated that the president will soon focus on credit cards. So there's an issue that's sort of in the pipeline. We'll hear, we'll hear more about that. Uh, 
further on the, uh, on the, on the stress test, anticipating uh, Secretary Geither yesterday before the TARP Congressional Oversight Committee stated that the majority of banks could be considered well capitalized. Uh, however, the government's uh, uh, efforts so far to get the banks lending again have displayed mixed results. Uh, anticipating the results of the stress test, uh, the administration's position is that needed capital must come from the private sector in the first instance. There's been discussion of a basically a six-month period during which banks who are told that they need more capital need to make arrangements to get that capital, uh, or in the meantime, uh, the government will perhaps convert some convertible preferred stock that they have or, or issue additional convertible preferred stock to those banks as a backstop in the interim. But the preference will be uh, to have uh, private uh, investment in those banks, which query whether private investment is interested in, uh, in getting in the banks at, at this particular time. But sort of that's the administration's stated way forward. Going on to uh, different agency uh, developments, <coughs> Treasury, uh, in sort of, this is slightly sort of a, the caboose following the train. The capital purchase program was the initial manifestation of the troubled asset relief program that was in the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act. You'll all recall that the original articulation of the statute uh, was that you would, the, the government would support or buy bad assets from banks, and that almost immediately was changed to capital investment in banks, the so-called capital purchase program. And we're only now just getting to the point where uh, we're doing the uh, asset purchases by virtue of the programs that I've mentioned before and we'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about in a minute. In any event, this, this particular announcement related to how does a mutual bank, a non-stock bank, uh, get, get qualify for this program. It follows the April 7th release of how does a mutual holding company get, get stock in the program. And this is the thing that now uh, 547 large and small institutions have actually been invested in by the U.S. Treasury. Uh, uh, trying to look for some good news on April 17th, Treasury stated that it had collected $2.52 uh, $2 billion in quarterly dividends on the stock that they had invested in banks in the capital purchase program. Interagency developments, uh, the Fed, o OTS and the National Credit Union Administration uh, proposed clarification of aspects of their December rules on, uh, under the Federal Trade Commission Act relating to unfair credit card practices. The Fed proposed clarifications of Reg Z. And just so you think that there is no more anti-money laundering prosecutions, on April 21, FinCEN and the Office of the Comptroller announced civil money penalties against the Qatar Bank, New York branch, for violations of the Bank Secrecy Act. So those things continue. They were, a, you know, a huge uh, theme and development in, uh, you know, in, re in recent history, and they still, they still go on. But uh, they're being replaced by safety and soundness issues and examinations, which I'll, which I'll mention in a second. Uh, at the Fed, uh, the sort of the, the spinmeisters were out in force, Chairman Bernanke and the Vice Chairman of the Board. And now the major theme that they're attempting to address is whether whether the result of all these of all these stimulus efforts will produce raging inflation at the end of the day. And they have an apologia for why in their in their view that in fact will not be the case. But anticipating that that's a theme that more and more people are concerned about uh, and it's sort of the next big issue up. Is it the next tsunami? Uh, they're you know they're they're addressing that in, uh, in their speaking engagements and uh, at least expressing their view to the effect that uh, that's, uh, that's in fact not the case. Then uh, I'll mention a, what I thought was a, was a very significant development but done sort of in a low profile way. Um, on April 17th, the representative of the legal staff of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System was speaking at the ABA Banking Law Committee meetings in Vancouver last week. And she's the, the, this particular person has been one of the leaders uh, in, the, in dealing with issues of how does private equity or non-traditional <laughs> investors get invested in banks. And obviously there's a lot of uh, you know, recognition of the facts that banks are capital needy. And the hope had been that in some manner or form there would be liberalization of the rules pursuant to which non-traditional uh, non investors could get involved in, um, in banking. And uh, as you probably all know, in, um, in the fall, there was a Fed interpretation of their sort of very 
prolix interpretations and rules of how, you know, how a private equity could get involved in banking, and it was construed by many in the business as a liberalization trend, an indication that, well, one of the solutions to, uh, uh, to the problems that we have is there'll be liberalized rules to let private equity get involved in banking. Not to worry, this person announced that the Fed's internal deliberations are that so-called silo applications would, no, would be not regarded with favor. A silo app application is a circumstance in which you have an aggregate of money that's under management and what's done is you create a special purpose vehicle that in effect it is on, on a, it's parallel to an existing or management organization that, that, in, that owns or controls investments that are not permissible to bank holding companies. And this was thought to be one of the means in which people could, in effect, get private money into banking and not, in effect, incur the responsibilities of bank holding company status for the entire organization. And what we were told at this uh, conference was that uh, there's no way that the Fed's going to allow that. So that was, that was interesting and a telling uh, sort of development in the sense that you're hearing the administration say private, you know, investment is the answer, but you're also hearing that all the old rules under the Bank Holding Company Act, the control provisions, will be vigorously, uh, you know, enforced and, uh, and continue to apply. Uh, uh, a number of written agreements, which are the Fed's uh, uh, euphemistic uh, description of cease and desist orders, um, have been issuing. They come out almost on a daily basis now. Most are for safety and soundness reasons now, meaning that banks are, have bad loans or that their, their capital is, uh, uh, is, uh, you know, is, is limited or, or, or starting to deteriorate. That's obviously not a good, uh, that's not a good, uh, un good sign. Uh, uh, now on to the FDIC. Uh, on April 10th, an informal comment period uh, ended for comments on the Fed's legacy loan program. The legacy loan program is one of the two parts of the administration's main effort under this private-public investment partnership to have private investment come into the banking business, both to purchase toxic loans and toxic securities. In any event, this program, which was announced uh, on, on March 23 in framework uh, form, attracted 419 comments, which the agency is now in the process of, uh, of looking through. But this program and its companion, the uh, Legacy Securities Program, they, they are the lineal descendants of, of, of TALP. This is, or TARP. This is, in effect, the government's answer to how are we going to save, uh, how are we going to save the banking system and hence save the economy uh, by, by making the banks or putting the banks in a position where they're, where they're able to lend again. Okay. Um, on last, the Friday after we last met, uh, two banks were, were closed on Friday, as is the FDIC's normal procedure uh, and won't. Um, one was uh, in North Carolina, uh, and another one was uh, in, in Colorado. Uh, the Colorado failure was, was notable for a couple of reasons. One was it wasn't really a tiny bank. It was a $2 billion bank, which in the old days, which we regarded as, you know, not a, not a big bank, but it's a fairly significant bank. In any event, at that uh, attempted orchestrated sale of the bank, which, you know, once the FDIC closes it, as you know, what they attempt to do is to find a successor institution that would assume the liabilities and, uh, uh, and buy some of the assets of the bank. Uh, nobody showed up at the auction. Uh, and not only did nobody show up to buy the, uh, uh, the uh, assets or assume the liabilities, but no one was even willing to act as a paying agent. So the government used an old trick that they had not yet not used since the Penn Square failure, for those of you of a certain age, and they set up a DINBI, which is a deposit insurance national bank, which basically, in effect, holds things in place for, for a 30-day period, in effect, continues banking services until they can find some manner to, uh, uh, to dispose of the assets and get the, uh, get the liabilities placed. One of the reasons for that result in this particular instance was the bank had a huge amount of brokered deposits which are, you know, thematically you're hearing more and more things about how the government disfavors those. And if you look back at the, uh, uh, you know, at sort of what's happened in resolutions over the last
last year, in which, as you probably know, there's been a dramatic increase in, a, in resolution activity. In more and more instances, the broker deposits are basically excluded from a transaction, even when they're able to organize, arrange a successor institution uh, to come in. Uh, last Friday, two more small banks went down. Those uh, were uh, those were assumed uh, by by successor uh, institutions arranged by the arranged by the FDIC. Those four banks are the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th banks to fail this year. That matches the total failures of all of last year. And I think the last the year before that there were three failures. Now, of course, last year you had the huge WAMU and Indy Mac, but nevertheless we're in April and we're we're matching what they uh, what we had last year for failures. Uh, somebody, some analyst has written that that he predicts. Uh, over a thousand failures over the next couple of years. I think that number is really high, but I think we're going to continue to see uh, small banks go down, and small banks now are the you know billion-dollar banks are the new small banks, um, and, uh, and the numbers will continue to get up there. So bank insolvency issues, and occasionally in these instances. Despite the fact that there are government support programs, you will have uh, depositors who lose money, which is a which is a bad thing in terms of uh, you know overall confidence in the banking system. On to the OCC, they did a few things: issued a rule uh, uh, giving a zero risk rating to asset bank backed commercial paper that's issued as part of the Federal Reserve support for money market funds. They issued a bulletin on accounting uh, guidance of the recent change in the FASB rules and uh, a new uh, a report on their uh, enforcement actions for the quarter, which again uh, is consistent with the observation that there's a huge uptrend in enforcement uh, activity. On to the SEC. They are now inviting public comment on whether they should extend uh, short sale restrictions. They uh, changed some of their rules to reflect the FASB uh, recent actions. They reopened comment on the uh, model privacy form under the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act. Uh, and they convened a roundtable on credit rating agencies. And as you well know, credit rating agencies, many people believe, were sort of at the heart of some of the problems that got us into the uh, the mess that we currently find ourselves in. Uh, the IRS issued some guidance relating to the tax treatment of the loan modifications made under the administration's uh, affordable uh, home mortgage modification program. FASB made the uh, changes that were anticipated uh, on fair value measurement and impairment on securities. Uh, and then on to uh, our friends in Washington Congress. Um, they held, the uh, Senate Banking Committee held hearings uh, on lessons of the New Deal to compare what happened to us then with what's happening to us now. Uh, Treasury released one of the reports that it's mandated to release under the Emergency uh, Economic Stabilization Act. Uh, House Financial Services Committee announced that they will hold hearings on mortgage reform uh, soon. And the, uh, the TARP Watchdog uh, Committee or watchdog, it's an individual uh, named, named Neil, uh, issued a report saying that Treasury uh, should be particularly careful orchestrating this next stage of the uh, private public investment program because it, it offers rampant opportunity for fraud. And they particularly went out of their way to criticize the FDIC's proposal to have a valuation expert that looks at the pools of loans that the FDIC is proposing to to sell in the uh, in the legacy in the legacy loan program, so there's a there's a substantial amount of heat developing on the as the as the doctor begins to perform the operation. Uh, that many critics have views on you know what the doctor's supposed to be doing and uh, and how. Marketplace developments. Uh, the journal um, organ uh, analyzing the same loan data that the Fed and uh, that the Treasury is speaking about uh, reports that actually uh, the figures, when you look at it correctly, um, that reflects a much bleaker picture than, in effect, the administration or Treasury was originally portraying. And then, sort of, you know, Treasury got on the same page in that, and that's why they're saying that their their in effect performance results have been mixed so far in terms of their ability to enhance uh, enhance lending on April. 20th, 
20th. The Dow Jones descended below 8,000, led by Bank of America, which announced the profit of 4.2 billion, but nevertheless cautioned that it had a lot of credit issues in the, you know, in the pipeline, and that was enough to spook the market. That ended a run-up in the financial sector earlier this month that was encouraged by some earnings reports that were, you know, maybe was among the first signs of perhaps some light, or maybe some light at the end of the tunnel, but that sort of uh, uh, was, was abruptly terminated. Uh, however, in response to uh, Geithner's remarks yesterday to the effect that uh, the vast majority of banks have enough capital, stocks went up again, the uh, financial stocks went up again um, the most in two weeks after he made his remarks yesterday uh, at, the, uh, at the Congressional Oversight Committee. Meanwhile, today, Boston Globe reports that Massachusetts banks are lining up to give the money back. So as the line is still forming on the mutual depository institutions, there's people in the front who want to try to give the money back. Uh, to the government to get rid of what they regard as the onerous uh, uh, conditions that are appended. Um, in litigation developments, there's been a tremendous amount of Madoff sequelae. Um, it, one development is that a uh, federal judge blocked uh, uh, Madoff's assets from being put into a bankruptcy, saying that there's a probable uh, cause that the assets will be forfeited to the government. And what we're seeing is the succession, succession of waves of lawsuits against uh, the, invest, the advisors who put people, in, uh, put people in the Madoff funds. That continues to be, to be reported. And then uh, lastly, on mysterious page seven in my outline, um, I, I had written in that uh, an L.A. jury had convicted Phil Spector, that some of you may have, may have heard of, uh, but Mr. Hurley thought that that was below the level of dignity of these presentations, so he deleted that in my presentation. That's what was that word again? Sequelae? Yeah. Yeah, it's a medical term. Uh, <laughs>